Okay, let's start. Welcome everyone. Thanks for dropping the hi in. I've also put again the link to the um, repository we will be working on for the very first part. We'll see how it goes this time. Maybe we'll even do some live programming, like do something live on stage, not everything pre-processed. Um, and um, so let's start. So this is the caching and performance deep dive 2.0. Um, we did a very nice session at DrupalCon Global um, this year already. Um, and we crammed a lot into 45 minutes, <laughs> including questions. But this time we have two hours, around about two minutes less than two hours now. And um, we can um, go a little bit slower. And my goal today is to um, give you um, an idea of um, how caching and performance works in detail. And um, there are other performance sessions here and I've looked a little bit at the questions there. And I so saw there's still some misunderstanding. What are cache tags? What are cache contacts? Why do I need those? What do I need when? And I really want to clear it up. Um, so my name is Fabian Franz. I'm the Vice President of Software Engineering at Tech One Consulting. And you can find me on Twitter and follow me on Twitter with at Fabian France. Very simple. Um, so overview of what we're going to doing. Uh, oh, yeah. And um, I'm the co-host of Big Pipe. Uh, together with Mamlias, and I've architected a large part of what I'll be presenting today, the large parts of the Drupal 8, 9, 10, whatever caching systems. I'm also uh, one of two Drupal 7 core maintainers and uh, several subsystems, including page cache, and also, funnily enough, the theme system. Um, so my motivation is really to teach you all I know about caching. Um, this is why I've come back on the stage. This is why I've come back to sessions, because while you all are doing a very, very great job in, in explaining this, um, there's many presentations about it, and I've seen the one about placeholders today. It, it warmed my heart because it was just so nice to see um, uh, all the work we've, we've done on this in core being used by someone, understood by someone, etc. But there's so much more potential still in this caching system. Um, that um, that we originally thought about of, of what you can do. And I really want to show you some more of what can be done. At the same time, I want to make it as beginner friendly as possible in that. Um, but, um, and, but for those that already know it, we will also be looking at some concepts from a different angle. So, um, and um, overall it will be roughly four parts with 20 minutes each that's planned and 10 minutes for questions in between parts. So we have roughly four times 30 minutes, so over two hours. Um, really as much as possible, beginner friendly, but the problem is I know too much better that it's very hard to know what you don't know anymore. So please ask questions, lots of it. I'm here for that. Um, and we'll be coming to one part that's probably more intermediate, um, but maybe it gives you some ideas. Um, this is not for learning how to expect to set up a Drupal 9 site for the first time. Other workshops are for that. It's also not a completely different session than at DrupalCon Global. There will be lots of things that are similar that you've already seen, but you know, might consider to come back in an hour or so, then we have lots of new things. Um, and in the session description, I've clearly outlined the uh, changes that are there so um, that everyone is on the same page. Because this time, part one, two, three are similar, but part four, we will be talking about CDN navigation and also indicate user caching, because it was like the number one question I got after my session last time. Um, so the general caching and cache invalidation strategies, um, cache items, cache max age, and tags. So we talk about how to invalidate caches. In this part two, we are talking about the um, 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 cache variation, the cache at ratio, placeholders, and how to deal with things that are just uncacheable because of well, the current time, you probably don't want to cache, maybe, unless you want to stop time, you have a magic stop timer. In part three, we talk about caching layers and some common caching pitfalls. And also here's lots of new stuff that's coming fresh from this year's um, 
a Black Friday performance optimization, so you're getting the bleeding edge of what's still not solved. Um, this overall will be um, an educational workshop, um, so you can get the code. I've already pasted the link in chat, so uh, you can find it there. Um, we'll also be having questions after each part, so not everything will be at the end, even though that would probably make you stay the two hours more, but no, no. Um, you can ask questions at any time. Um, I have, have a questions board here, uh, which we can switch to, so we can look at all, your, all the questions here and um, do it. And essentially, to use the code, you just install Drupal 9 via DDEV or bring your own Drupal 9 install, you copy it into modules custom, you enable the cache edu module, and um, the best would be to use the Umami theme because that's also what I'm using and it works well. So um, let's quickly talk about what is caching. In computing, a cache is a hardware or software component that stores data so that future requests for data can be so fast that that's stored in a cache. Um, Wikipedia is correct, but complicated. So let's make this much simpler. So much theory. We have a restaurant, and this theme will be coming through the whole session and we prepare meals with our pages. And our pizza takes 10 minutes to prepare. And the takeaway is uh, the pizza is wrapped and then given out. So um, this is caching in a nutshell. If we don't always take 10 minutes to prepare our page, which no user probably wanna wait, um, but instead we have it pre-prepared here for us um, and then we just give it out. That's caching. That's all you need to understand about caching. Whenever you think about cache, think about pizza. It makes work even nicer. So the performance of the pizza delivery is improved. Uh, one of the problems with this analogy is um, even if you are the best shop in the world, you only have a finite number of pizzas pre-prepared because you don't know um, that there will be thousands of Drupal con attendees coming now and wanting a pizza right now. Uh, so for the sake of this example, we'll be having a magic replicator. The customer comes, we replicate the pizza that we prepared earlier, um, and uh, then we give it away. So this magic replicator essentially means we can prepare one pizza one time, we replicate it then, and then we only give those copies away. And it will always be a fresh bit. Um, every item that we cache in general gets a name. That's a cache item name or cache address or cache key. Um, in Drupal, it was called once a cache ID, but we later call it also a cache key. In a sense, it's all the same. It's essentially the name for your cache item. It's how you identify it. So for example, if we have a pizza margarita and we use a cache key sample, then we have like pizza margarita in an array. But if you use it as a cache ID, we would use pizza margarita as that ID. So let's make pizza. And here's our example. Um, we have a pizza cache, pizzas. And um, we are getting a pizza margarita out of the cache. And if there is a pizza, cache pizza already, then we deliver it via our magic replicator, the cache pizza data. And if there's not, then we call the pizza oven to make us a nice margarita. And um, then we set the margarita. And um, that's all we need, essentially. So who, who sees the bug? There's a bug here, and we're looking at that also in our practical example, because this is our example one here exactly. And um, we just reload that several times. Um, and it's broken the break. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe I need to log in. 
but that's the nice thing about a workshop, you are live, so um, yeah. Now the data is correct. Um, and yes, Casper, you're com completely correct. The cache key is different between the get and the set. Um, so we're still clearing caches here. Um, that's exactly what's the problem. And one of the things, and this has happened to me in real life, this um, getting of a pizza margarita and then setting, not of a margarita, but on a huge Black Friday thing, several years ago, there was a problem. Everything looked perfect, but the site was still very slow and no one could really figure out why it, why it was because there had been caches for all functions added. Why was it still slow? And finally, there was like this, here was a get, and then it was here like lots of code, lots of things, etc. And finally, here was a set. And like in this example, it used different cache keys. So um, that is why this is a much, much better pattern. You just define the cache ID once, and then you just use this cache ID here and here. So let's see if, if, if our, our thing is working now. Just running it. So um, the next thing we need to know is how long is the product valid? Obviously, with pizza, it usually has the best before date. So um, it's not valid infinitely long. So um, the problem is the pizza after a while looks like this. And for your own sake, I've intentionally omitted this image. Um, but you really don't want to eat it anymore. So the solution that all supermarkets in the world have is an expiration date. And exactly like that, we can do as well. So we have the cash ID here. We have the time to live here. Uh, we have our pizza oven. Uh, we make the margarita. And I've, I've omitted the get code because you've already seen it. It's just a setting code. Um, and then we essentially use time here and the time to live. So we say this is valid for 10 minutes. So this is in seconds. And um, this is how you can set an item in the cache that automatically expires. Now let's see if our demo is working by now. Yeah, there we go. So here you can see uh, with the broken one, I always get a different pizza margarita, um, but with the fixed one, hopefully. Yeah, okay. I'm reloading. Um, and you always get the, the same pizza migration in the end. Um, so best before us now our example is expiration. So, um, and here we, we do something nice. Once we have something um, in the cache, we show exactly how this cache item looks internally in the database. This is um, really nice to know because this is kind of like exactly how the database is structuring this. So we used a little bit different uh, CID here than in the presentation just so that it doesn't clash with that one. And it says it has six seconds left to live. So if I reload it again, it's gone again. Reload it again. It's cached again for, okay, now seven seconds still. Goes towards in database or somewhere else. It has a CID, which is like the cache ID. The data, which I've omitted here because that's essentially this. Um, the created date, the expiration date, that is serialized, the text, the checksum, and if it's valid or not. And we're coming to that a little bit later because we can also um, uh, get something from the cache that's invalid. So, um, yeah, this is our, our pizza margarita, and um, there we go. So it's ex as simple as that. And the page cache in Drupal 3 to that six worked exactly like this. You just put an expiration date of 10 minutes uh, unconditionally, no expiration at all. And that works. And it's still pretty great for high traffic sites. Um, it's the most simple way to get your, your site uh, working nicely is to just cache it for 10 minutes and don't deal with anything. And if your business is fine with 10 minutes outdated data, it will save so much headache. Uh, questions, please, in, in, in questions, I think. 
Uh, okay, we can also do them in the discussion chat. Uh, Joe, could you could you add your question to the live Q and A? Hopefully that's on. Yeah, it should be on. Um, because that's simple for later showing. Um, so um, yeah, this is how you can cash for ten minutes unconditionally. So um, now we've did all those pizzas, we prepared lots of pizzas and we can keep them for a while. So at the weekend, we need to clean up. And um, this is important for you to know because all other methods we will be showing later actually don't clean up. They only expire and invalidate, but the cache is never really cleared. And that has led to some performance problems as well in Drupal 9. So if you wanna just remove one item, you just take the cache service and you delete this item. And if you want to delete all the pizzas, then you just delete all. And that is essentially. And again, we can, can show it. So we have here our cache two. And now we need to uh, see that this pizza margarita is seven and it doesn't change. So what we're going to do is we're going to, are going to clean up uh, all the pizzas now. This says all the pizzas cleaned up. Go back here. And we got pizza margarita 77. That's fine now, seven before 77 now, coincidence. Um, so this is how you uh, how you clean up. Um, so um, we're gonna get to questions in a moment. Um, so um, one of the things people asked was, hey, how do I find my new pizzas cash bin? And it's very simple. You just see it in cacheedu.services.yml, just have the pizzas cash bin, we have the class here, the tags, we're at the factory and here the agreements name. And essentially, this is the internal service name and this is the name of the cache bin. And we just add the tag and that's it. So uh, simple copy and paste. So um, oh, I think I'll take some questions for a moment. Let's see. Okay. Let me quickly answer two questions. So before we continue, what is recommended putting onto the pizza or even better when uh, get too big? We'll come to that later. <laughs> so we leave that question not yet answered. I start for a moment. Um, and um, I saw that there's no method to get all items from bin. Is that possible somehow? So something like get all CID. In theory, it's possible. Um, it's not recommended, however, because there's cache bin items that don't support that. Um, and um, you would also need to know what's your use case for that. Because if you want to just have a list of items in the cache, you could just have another cache item that has the array, essentially, where you um, where you store um, the um, all the items you've created already. Okay, this one's answer. If you have a page and custom link, it's the page. Um, I'm trying to understand the question. <laughs> um, if you remove cache from custom form or custom link, it is still cache because of page cache. Um, so uh, there's several ways to um, circumvent page cache, if that's what you're asking. If not, you need to um, to do that. And actually, I'm doing that. <laughs> so in um, our controller, as a pizza shop, um, in the deliver function for delivering the pizza, our secret thing, um, we actually call the page cache kill switch and trigger it to completely disable page cache for this page because we don't want to want to cache it. That's one way to do it, I guess. And if that doesn't answer the question, please ask it again because I'm not sure I understood yet. Can you show how this is rendered in the page? Um, how what is rendered in the page? Is the question? Um, I mean, I can show the code again. Um, how we do it, but essentially we have this pizza object and the pizza object is um, 
just for the sake of example, is converted to a string here and we just return the markup for that from our controller. Um, and again, you can also browse the code on GitHub while, while doing that, et cetera. So um, that should be good. Okay, consider this answer. If not, just ask again and we we'll, can we'll get a little bit more on that. So um, continuing further, we are great success. People love it. And um, but um, now we want to offer a frozen margarita as well. So first, let's talk what is a good Margarita pizza idea. So duff with zero zero floor, pin of salt and water, nothing more. Then we have some custom made tomato sauce, mozzarella, and that's it. So that's a great margarita pizza. And um, again, we um, can now keep it for longer because it's a frozen margarita. We call our pizza maker service, we make a frozen margarita. Um, Basil, basil, not oregano or mandarin. That's something different. Um, and we can keep that even for 30 days. So we have a pizza margarita, we put it in the frozen pizza bin, we make it frozen and we set it here and put the time to live. So let's quickly recap how our shop works. Um, the customer drives to our pizza shop, the customer orders a frozen pizza margarita because they want to do it at home. The waiter gets pizza from his fridge at the counter. He checks the expiration date. If it's expired, then he gets one from central storage in the cellar. So we have two layers essentially, like directly in the fridge, and then we have something in the cellar. Then we replicate the pizza, the magic thing, and we deliver the pizza to the customer. So this is how it works. Now we can offer a marinara as well. And What's very important is this is a vegan pizza. So same dough, same tomato sauce, but the ingredients are extra virgin olive oil, oregano, and garlic. Um, so, uh, and this, uh, this is a vegan pizza. Obviously, you can put whatever um, you want in your tomato sauce. It's custom made, so it's your choice. Um, so this is a completely new pizza. It's not a variation and it's now an offer. So because it's a new pizza, we make it a new cash ID. It's a pizza marinara. We are again stored in frozen pizzas, pizza maker, make it frozen and be delivered. And if you want to, want to see that, we can, we can just do a very quick look at our factory. We have our pizza maker here and here we make our margarita and our marinara. There you go. Uh, you don't see the. Okay, there seems to be a slight delay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to switch back to slides. Hopefully, uh, now we are back to slides. Um, okay, just now I cannot context switch as fast. <laughs> Good. Um, so we have great success. We are growing, um, but we need a, a, but soon we do a super secret expedition to Italy and we find a better recipe for the Duff and the, the Pizza Duff 2.0. And this Pizza Duff 2.0, it's fantastic. We are loving it, but it, we need to invalidate all the cached old pizzas and we don't want to wait for 30 days. But how do we know if they are new or old? Unfortunately, our pizza Baker was so enthusiastic that he directly started and now we have some pizzas here, some pizzas there. Maybe you look at the best before date, huh? There must be some better way. And there is a better way. So one of the ideas could be, that's a definitely naive solution. We could just add the dev version two here into our cache key. And then we add uh, that now it's a different, um, Tomato sauce, and then we add that um, this has a lot of other ingredients, so our cash key gets long and long and long and long. Um, and in the end, probably not the best idea because this does not scale. And the other part is all the old versions are also kept around for 30 days. We really would like to not give them out anymore, not have them stacked anymore. 
And especially if we create a new, because we have like one version part, um, we definitely want, um, want to have one pizza we replicate. So it's not a variation. It's our new version of the pizza. But we need to know what's new or old. So this is really totally mess and it could get messy and messy and messy. And I did that mess with render cache 1.0 in Drupal 7. I did exactly that for expiration. <laughs> Just put a hash on it on, on things like that. And um, with memcache, it worked well with database as well, for obvious reasons. Um, so um, we all evolve in that, um, and cache takes a much, much better idea for doing that. So the idea is we give it a tag. So essentially, you have lots of boxes in your storage, and you don't know, is this product version 1, product 2, product 10, whatever, what you are doing, you label it. You put a label on it, you put a tag on it, and then you exactly know these are the um, DAS version 2, this is DAS version 1, and you know it. So, um, and that's very simple to do. We just add a new argument to our um, to our set function, the DAF version here. And um, that's essentially it. And now it's tagged. Um, and the better way is, again, to, to put it up here. So the cache tags equals DAF version. Put the cache tags here. We have CID, pizza, expire, and cache tags. And once we want to... Um, once we want to release a new effort, we just do that. We invalidate the tags, um, and that's it. Um, so, um, Drupal tags um, the versions of tags automatically. And while I have some slides to explain it, it's much easier to see. So, hopefully, you can see a screen now. So, we have a margarita, and um, once it's cached, uh, which for a very long time, we see it has a checksum of zero, and it also has no tags. So this is an untagged pizza margarita. So we don't know if this is floor version one or floor version two or whatever. Now we have in the marinara this tags. And again, short moment to, to cache it. Um, now we have it, and here we have the DAF version. And because I've already did this a few times, we are already at version 12 now. <laughs> and uh, you can also see the checksum is 12. And you can see the text is def version. And now if you want to invalidate it, all we are doing is essentially we are, we are clicking this invalidate def version. And then now we see that the def version has increased to 13 internally in Drupal in the cache text table. So, and we can do it again. We we'll click again and now it's invalidate to 14. And now if we click the marinara again, it's not cached. So we get a very fresh pizza marinara again, fresh from the pizza oven. And uh, if you click here, now it has dash version uh, 14. That is essentially what is uh, what is on the pizza. And the checksum is 14. This matches. So um, the pizza is given out. And again, if I now click on it again, we can play this endlessly. Invalidate that version. What happens is that the internal checksum is saying 14, but this uh, version is saying 15. It doesn't match, so it isn't given out. So this is cache tags, the internals, how it works internally in Drupal. So we can think of the tag of uh, a version number. Really think of it like a version number, um, because that's what it is. Tagging is versioning. You're versioning your, your things. And the version is how often it has invalidated. Whenever you save an entity, whenever you save node one, in the cache text table, magically the node column one thing will be increased one time. And this is how you can think about it. So there's several ways of tagging, and we could use all of them. You could use versions, which core or um, or timestamps. You could use names, or you could use counters. So nothing would stop you from creating a cache tag service in core that would use animals for things. Just a little bit problematic that probably at some point we would run out of animals, but you could do it. Um, so whenever node one is saved, cache tag is invalidated, we increase the version. So the cache tag should be version 43. And again, as we've seen on the example, we compare it. 
So once you've mastered this, um, this is so powerful to know. And again, um, whenever you um, you use something, you use an entity, you use a current username, you use anything that has that's coming from a database that's not static that can change. Whenever you use anything that can change, think about a cache tag. That is when you need to use a cache tag. Uh, there was a question like. On the um, in, in the previous uh, session on variation, like, hey, um, why do I also need to use the user cache tag? Because the user's name can change. Whenever you, you, you use something, think about the dependency it has. That is absolutely crucial to understanding caching in Drupal. Many things are done automatically. We add entities a lot of the time, um, and you don't have to deal with it. You just add it as a cacheable dependency on your render array, we can do that a little bit later. Um, but um, in essence, if you use a user and you look at your output, uh, the back output, and you don't see the user and the cache tags, then you have uh, have a problem because if you change the user, your site will still show the same content, and that's not what you want. So um, also, of course, is cheating. <laughs> because um, we are always using the same current version within the same request. So um, in other words, for example, the waiter is just checking the list of DAF versions once a day and not every minute. So not every time he is checking like, um, this pizza and this, what is the version right now? No, we don't do it. We just do it once every request. So how does our shop work with tagging? The customer drives to our pizza shop, he orders a frozen pizza margarita, he gets a pizza from the fridge at the counter, and then he checks the expiration date and the tax. Then he marks the pizza as valid or invalid, and if the pizza is not valid, he gets one from center storage in the cellar, replicates the last pizza customer as usual. So the only thing really has changed that he's also checking is the tag valid right now. So we know how to get an item from the cache, set an item into the cache. So it's very important. And there's three ways to expire the cache. There's direct deletion or invalidation by name of item. There's also an, not only a delete function, but also an invalidate function for invalidating a cache item. Um, there's time-based invalidation. And again, this can work for so many things so well. So don't put that off yet. And then there's tag-based invalidation, which is this cache tags and really the most granular way of doing invalidation, of doing expiration of things um, that um, you can do it. And um, don't forget, we create a new cache because we store this list of versions uh, for the tags inside the request for the time of the request. We don't solve the problem of cache cache invalidation, we just move it somewhere else. <laughs> so many said like, ah, oh, we've solved cache invalidation now with cache tags. And that's unfortunately not really true. So uh, yeah, let's see if there are some more questions. Um, those are all answered, I think. Yep, those are all answered. So, okay. Um, then um, we continue, I think. So um, what should you catch? Our story continues two years later. Um, we've grown even more. Success is great. We are ready for new products. Um, so what we are going to offer now in our Pizza Shop 2.0 is we want to offer a gluten-free DAF, a vegan mozzarella, a pizza spinaki. So we need new pizza variations, a gluten-free offering, a vegan margarita offering, and the marinara is always vegan. So really those are variations of the same pizza. It's, it's not a new pizza, it's a variation. Um, so um, quick recap, um, the customer comes and orders a pizza, the waiter asks for the preferences, vegan gluten-free, and he then checks the fridge for the wanted variation, and then he gives the wanted variation to the customer, or produces it and then stores it in the fridge. So essentially, um, we now ask the customer for his preferences. So um, again, we could just add it to the name. And the problem with adding it to the name is we end up with a lot of variations. 
uh, vegan gluten fry, vegan gluten, vegan turn, and then we also add up with uh, marinara that's vegetarian, and that doesn't really exist because marinara is always vegan. So um, this really doesn't scale. So what we more would like is more like like a tree structure. So the gluten free, gluten, gluten free, gluten, and there's a, another reason why this is not really working because the problem is if you now made your pizza margarita here with this long cache ID, um, but the page cache would think uh, this is always the same pizza margarita, um, then how could it now essentially what your user's preference is? Um, so um, a later cache would not know your variations and. That's why this does not work. It's what we tried in core first, <laughs> to be precise, for blocks. And um, so, yeah, it's not the same. Um, so what we're using for radiation is, and we, we've learned that ourselves in, in Drupal 8, 9, essentially, is cache contacts. We are using them for variation, and they are computed on demand. So this is key. This is absolutely key. You can always compute a cache context on demand. You don't need to execute the whole page till coming to this decision of what pizza, what the user wants. Does he wants vegan, or does he wants a vegetarian pizza? Does he wants gluten free or not? And um, we can always compute that on demand. We could have a blank page that does nothing except for ask um, showing what the preference of the user is. So. It depends on nothing besides what is inputted into it. Um, and then it internally adds the cache context values to the cache ID name. So this is doing essentially exactly what we were trying to do manually, and they do it automatically. So it says Sweden, yes, no, gluten for yes, no. And um, so our name essentially changes, but because we give core the option to do it, um, we can do lots of interesting things. So whenever you think of variation, think of a cache context. Don't do it yourself. Um, because especially if it depends on, for example, the user's preference. Because if you do it yourself, you will have huge problems in having this page still be correctly cached. Um, and again, we have our pizza marinara, and here we have only the gluten-free cache context, so it's only gluten-free, yes, no. So intelligent variation is um, essentially the customer orders a frozen pizza margarita, and then he looks at the, first looks at the pizza variations for the margarita, and then he asks the customer for his preferences being and or gluten-free. So. Um, it essentially knows um, first that this margarita has those two possible variations. And if he would be looking at the marinara, he would be saying, hey, this only has a vegan cash context. So he doesn't even ask the customer for, hey, do you want a, want a vegan? But only the question if it's gluten free. One of the problem with cash context is right now, still they only work with vendor arrays. Um, and um, it took us quite some time to understand depth on how this whole structure and uh, two-level caching uh, could work. In theory, we, we could provide it as a service in the future. There's a core issue um, if anyone wants to take a stab at it. And there's also a Drupal org project um, that can be used for decoupled uh, variations. Um, but um, essentially, um, it has no Drupal 9 release yet. so. Um, might not be the best choice right now for this. So um, maybe this core issue is a better one. It will be updated eventually, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, this is essentially the two parts. For most use cases, the variation cache works. Uh, the Drupal core way with render arrays works good enough. It was even good enough for views uh, internally to do it. So um, probably the thing. So, um, now the whole time we've been using the caching layer kind of like directly. Um, and, um, but now we want to essentially um, use a render array instead. And um, we can take this structure that we have here and convert it into a render array very simple here. Because that's way too quick and I don't want to go 
uh, back and forth. Here it is. Here's, here it is um, from here to there. So um, essentially, um, the um, the first part sets up the cache get and cache set calls, um, and we told Duple to store the item in this cache bin. So again, this is this. Then, <coughs> pardon. Uh, we set up the cache keys again. Pizza marinara, pizza marinara cache ID, and Drupal essentially converts that into that anyway. The max age is new key, which is essentially our time to live, the same as we have here, and then we have the tags, which are the cache tags, the same as here. And now the most difficult about that part come is we have a pre-render function, and that's it. The, that's essentially a cache miss function. So Drupal does when it sees this array, it essentially checks, is there a pizza marinara item in frozen pizzas? And if there is, directly stop, return it. Uh, and if it's still valid, return it, and you're good to go. Then this render array is directly returned and nothing more to do. But if we have the pre-render here, um, then um, we are creating the, the pizza here. Um, and we're using the pizza maker, and we have this um, function, which is a cache miss function. So um, in this cache miss function essentially um, allows us to um, create our serialized pizza here. So here we create our, our pizza element, which needs to, be a string, needs to be convertible to a string, which pizza is. So, um, and, um, the next time we call it um, on a cache miss, then this pre-render is called. It creates our elements pizza. And so um, and this, what you see here, this what is returned here, this is automatically stored in the cache. So after this whole build has finished and is ready to be rendered on the page, uh, then essentially um, we are putting the um, um, the um, pizza here into this bin with those keys. Uh, just a moment. Question. Can all breathe for a moment? Just can all meditate on that for a moment. because this is really important. Because from now on, we're just gonna go further with the render array. And this is also how most often you will be building things within Drupal right now. So um, this is what we're gonna be using for now. Okay, and now it's very simple to just add cache context. We just add context, user.region, user.gluten-free, and there we go. <laughs> now this pizza is varied by if the user's preferences are vegan or gluten-free and gluten-free. The problem is now we've done exactly what we didn't want to do. We created a variation for a vegetarian pizza marinara. So to avoid that, um, oh yeah, and we can also add the cache context later. So um, it's really a different way to create the same array. Um, so now what we can do is we can add the cache context also, and that's important. Here we're adding it before creating this build, but now we can also call, um, do it within our pre-render function. So let's say it wasn't obvious by the pizza name of what variations, etc. cetera, are there. You can always add it after the fact. So we'll now there will always be a variation of if it's gluten free or not because it just depends on that. And then we now for the pizza margarita we also have this veg uh, vegan option. So um, this is how um, the pizza name can be can be like that. So um, and um, that way um, we we have our cake now or our pizza now essentially and can eat it. Um, because we have the gluten-free added always and the region option only if it's pizza margarita. Uh, 
for obvious reasons, because this only depends on the pizza name, we could also be doing this outside of this function. However, um, we don't want to um, we don't want to um, do this because I really want to show you that regardless how deep you are within the caching system somewhere, regardless of if it's a face of the moon or whatever you need to vary on, you just can create the cache context while you are creating your things. And that makes it much simpler to, at certain points when you are deep somewhere in to just add it and it will work. And that's the nice thing about it. And this is how you create a cache context, essentially. You just uh, extend the user cache context because we depend on the user. We're getting the label and the vegan user. And then we just check um, of the, if the value of the field region for the user is yes or no. And that's it. This is our cache context right there. So um, it's very simple to just say, hey, um, this is the vegan user. Um, and then we just uh, register it as a service. So we add, and this name is very important, cache context.user.region. So this is our name for the cache context. And um, it's also important that it's, it's part of user um, because we have a cache context hierarchy. So whenever you do something that depends on the user, it's important to um, use this user naming scheme for something that comes way later. Um, and then you just add the tag name cache context and that's it. This is how we create our cache context in our cache edu.service in HML or pizza. Ta-da, works great, perfect. Uh, Fetch is full. <laughs> so a uh, little bit of problem um, because we have so many variations. But before we go into that cliffhanger, we're going to check if there's more questions. Oh, yeah. Um, we are shown the label of the cache context. It's shown nowhere right now, as far as I know. Um, this was made for being able to essentially use cache context within a, a graphical user interface. So, for example, that in theory, you could have a block and it could, could do something and you could just select the cache context. Um, um, when should I use a tag or a cache context? I'm not sure I get the difference. That is uh, the point. Um, a tag is for expiration. A cache context is for variation. Again, think of our pizza, pizza things. Um, a tag is essentially saying this expires at this date or check this version is still current when we are shipping out the product. Think of keyboards. You have lots of keyboards and you have lots of boxes. And um, and um, Janie, don't, don't uh, answer the questions till I'm finished, please. <laughs> um, so that audience can keep the question in mind. Um, so uh, you have lots of boxes in your warehouse and all of those boxes um, essentially uh, for the products and you have the old product variation, you have the new product variation, and you have a label on them. And this label is your cache tag. And that's so important because this, this label cache tag is, is essentially uh, giving you the, the possibility of, um, of knowing, is this a product we still wanna ship out? Or think of a news article. You've, you've created some news article, now you've updated it and you wanna, give out this news um, and you want to want to update it so you need to have some way of checking has this changed so the cash tag is always the question has this changed drupal needs to answer this question and cash takes are the way for it a cash context is a true variation for it for example you want to because you are very esoteric or whatever you want to give the user a different news article every time the face of the moon changes so, um, or if they have a, have a preference of having UK English. So you have this article in two different variations and you're giving out the variation to the user if they prefer British English and you're giving the American variation if they prefer American English. 
So you use a cache context whenever you create a variation of the same thing. Or you have a block that says, hi, user, hi, Fabian, hi, Joes, hi, Alexander. And um, in that way, um, you can essentially, um, in that way, you can essentially um, say, um, um, this block should change when Fabian changed his name on the side. But it should always be different per user. It's like the old, if you are familiar with Drupal 7, cache per page, cache per role, cache per user. Um, but cache context put that on a way more granular level and are way more powerful. So um, that a little bit to the point. I'm, I'm writing a little bit on it because it's so important to understand this difference. Cache tag, expiration, cache context, variation. Now it's answered. Uh, variation cache. Uh, I've talked a little bit about it. Um, variation cache essentially allows you to directly um, use cache context with this nice set and get. Uh, API, I've already shown it on a slide before. You can find it in the slides as well. So um, I know it, and it had a Drupal 9 port. And in a sense, it allows you to use cache context without render arrays with the same power. Oh, great. So uh, one of the problems of um, so many variations is um, that the fridge can be full at some point. Because we have so many variations, because now every pizza is not not just um, one pizza margarita and one marinara, that's just two, that's easy. But now we have two pizza margarita and one, uh, and now we have even four pizza margarita and we have two pizza marinara already six months. And now we add a pizza spinaki and it's bored way less. Uh, not sure. No one likes spinach, apparently. Some do, some don't. Um, at least in our pizza, sh uh, pizza shop, it's not bought much. So um, this custom pizza is essentially uncashable. And um, um, uh, we still produce it, but we won't have it directly on the fridge. So you'll have to wait for a short moment. And uh, uh, my friend Moshe, who's also here by now, is, hey Moshe, great to have you. He created a very nice project called Cache Metrics. And there you can see essentially um, how your cache at ratio is. And if you have like margarita, 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 and marinara, 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 but spinaki less so, then it might be a good idea to just say this is uncacheable. And that's a good way to, to solve that. So we disable the cache, and the easiest is to not cache them all. And that's very simple to do, especially with vendor arrays. We just put the cache max h to zero. So you're building a page, you do something, and suddenly you have something that you never want to cache. You always want to rebuild because it has way too many variations. And um, or you have a cacheable object, and you say set cache max h zero. Um, so for a full example of that is we have our pizza name um, and um, and if we have a spinaki, then we make the max h zero. And if we fall through, um, we do it the same. Or even we could have custom pizza. We make a custom pizza out of the ingredients, but the uh, max h is again zero. So and um, then the early return here. So um, there's another possibility to essentially create the pizza, and um, and then we. Um, make a custom pizza, and again, we set max h zero in both cases. Um, the other thought is um, we could we can always set the cache max h zero after a function has been rendered. Um, there's a little bit of pitfall here. If you started with caching the pizza spinaki, and now you suddenly set max h to zero, Drupal still happily will retrieve it from the cache. So whenever you add something like that, just clear your cache after making such change during local development. That happened to me more often than I'd like to admit. So I'm really giving you the hint of, of doing that. Um, so and there's several times to do it uh, with Drupal, with Drush. Thanks much for adding that. <laughs> 
when we have about that, or you can call Drupal Core Cache and validate tags. The rendered cache tag, which essentially is always added to everything that's rendered on the page. So this is a get out of jail free card. <laughs> um, um, and um, so um, there's also another possibility, and that will always work and don't need you to clear the cache. You can always disable the cache before it is retrieved. So we could essentially say, if the pizza name is customer spinaki, then we make the cache mix h0. And as you can see, this is not in the pre-render in our cache miss function. Um, this is essentially just here in this in this array. And now we've put the pizza name as a property on this. And now the pre-render is essentially looking at the property and making a pizza out of that. But here we are essentially saying to Drupal, whenever you encounter this render array, Drupal sees max h0, doesn't cache it directly. So whenever you know before creating things here in the pizza, et cetera, that something is never cacheable, just put it not in the pre-render, like in the cache miss function, but put it directly where the build is. So much simpler, so much easier for that. Uh, to do, or if you're writing a blog, put the get max age function to return zero. Um, yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> it's always more efficient to disable the cache before it's retrieved from the cache. And that's similar to a request-based cache policy. So for page cache, you have both request-based cache policies. So essentially, a request comes in, you say, is this cacheable? Yes or no? Uh, or you have a response-based cache policy. Oh, this wasn't cacheable, so let's not store it. But we still try to retrieve it from the cache before. Um, so um, let's look at quickly. Um, uh, yes, it's definitely possible. I still have to commit some of the presentation code. Um, I. Um, mm, Wanted to do a little bit too much with the first example because it was so important. So I still have to um, finish the cache video a little bit. Um, so that um, still needs to be done. But um, yeah, we can also do something else at live. But I think we are pretty good in time. So let's see how many questions we have and how that. Um, but yeah, we could could do something. Um, so how can we delete expire cache context or clear the cache context once set? Uh, you're not using cache context for clearing. You're putting a cache tag on it. Like for example, if you want to always be able to single out the pizza spinaki and all its variations, if you didn't want to not cache it, then you could just put a cache tag on it. You would just add like, um, let me go to a terminal, just, it's shouldn't have helped. Um, so essentially, that's not for the code here, but I'm just using it for quickly okay, showing you that. So essentially, you would build cache tags, and you would just add, for example, the Spinaki cache tag. Oh, here's, here's no build here. So there's a totally the wrong point to add this, but um, uh, essentially, this is how you add a cache tag to um, to uh, something you want to expire. And then you can use the drush command again to do it. And then um, you can do it. OK, let's remove that again. OK. Uh, questions. So cache contexts are not for expiration, they are for variation. Cache change. So no pizza shop creates a pizza always from scratch. Um, the pizza is made from pre-prepared things. So the dev, a good dev, even needs 12 to 24 hours till it's ready. And we have the tomato sauce and we have the ingredients like we've seen. And um, the pages consist of different cached and uncached parts. So we have the main page response, which we need to custom cache. And then we have the blocks, the menus, the header, the footer. And those are essentially the decoration around the main page response. So whenever we we see like like this here, then we have like here's the header, 
Um, here's the, the logo, here's a menu, here's a secondary navigation. And here, finally, <laughs> is the actual output from our controller. So um, uh, this is the output from the controller. And this is all the decoration that is around it. However, some things like this is active, this is active. So this depends on the page in a way, um, but um, not as much as something that would be deep in here. So um, now we would have two ways to create a pizza with mushrooms. Uh, we could start with an empty pan. We uh, could add the dough, add the tomato sauce, add the mozzarella cheese, and then add the mushroom. So that's one possibility. Or we could just use a finished pizza margarita and just add the mushrooms to it. So um, that's uh, uh, probably a much more efficient way. So, um, and that's actually what the true power of dynamic page cache is. We cache response and then we add flavor on placeholders afterwards. So um, this is another variation essentially that came a little bit later. That is why Drupal, I suppose, the, the cache context was varying something and bubbling that through. And um, also there's placeholders because what I really found out is essentially if we have something that's not cacheable, it's it, it's not so nice to have your whole page, even if we know exactly that that's correct, be varied by user because then every page would be varied by both page and by user. And if you've ever done then some uh, Drupal 7 uh, work on that and did put a blog on pick, cache per page and per user, it doesn't really have that much great cache at right here. So placeholders are the way to solve that because essentially you're splitting up the page in all the static parts and then the dynamic parts. And funnily enough, the front end world with React and all those, they're, they're kind of starting to, to uh, realize this, um, that not everything needs to change all the time, but that there are some highly dynamic parts and some parts that are always static and only change like when there's a whole page change request in that. So um, Drupal is a little bit ahead here <laughs> in that um, and has a very nice concept of this placeholders and it's so powerful. Um, because um, there's um, essentially two ways we could be doing it. We could be disabling the dynamic or the page cache or both, and we could just cache all the inner parts. Like this is a blank pen and we create everything from scratch. Um, this is essentially when we take this example and we cache this like we do, and then we cache independently like this menu, and then we cache independently this menu and this form we cannot cache still, and we cache this logo and etc. cetera. Um, this is one way to do it. So we assemble it out of the other cached parts and some of them are not cacheable, or we just cache the whole page and then there's if there's just something that would be um, like very dynamic, then we use placeholder for that. Um, and this is essentially, we cache the whole response in dynamic page cache and we just add some placeholders for this dynamic data. And here we come to something important because both have its thing. Routine free pizza, that cannot be a placeholder. Is a foundation of our pizza, the whole dev changes. So we need both. We need the variation of varying all the cache entries. For example, Drupal takes the a very pragmatic approach of saying everything in the render cache is always varying by user permissions because else it would not be secure. We decided that a Drupal con Los Angeles at one point where like uh that could be a little bit insecure to show like admin like data to some user. We never want to experience that, so that's always added. Um, and this is variation that is varying all cache entries, and it's good that we do it like that. And then we have placeholders, and you can think of them as out of band. And it's important to decide that case by case. A placeholder in Drupal has one property. It's important that it can be independently rendered. So the same as cache context. If you have a placeholder, um, you can be called like directly after um, 
bootstrap essentially when the main controller starts to even before the main controller is started so for a placeholder you need to know that the main controller might not even be executed at all um, so it must not depend on anything that has been executed before so what would be a whole no-go would be that if this um, pizza controller um, if it was creating this pizza here, if it was like, like, and let's be very dirty here, if that was saying some, some global um, variable, and we would just say, hey, um, add things will happen because, yes, they do. Um, and then somewhere, on the page it would want to output this global state then um, in a placeholder then this would never be there this global variable would not be there the state would not be there so essentially it's not here so um, this is why um, the placeholder um, it's important to know it can be independently rendered and for example it's not possible to add more V to the DAF after the pizza is finished already or floor to the DAF after it's finished already. That doesn't make sense. So um, think very carefully of how you do your placeholders. And here's a classified top secret way of creating a placeholder. You just add um, attach placeholders. You add the, and you use some secret key like this ingredients placeholders, very secure. And um, you put that to our, your, your normal build that you want to put there, which is your independently rendered thing. And then you put your markup and you put ingredients placeholders. And that's all that is to placeholders. It's just a unique key on the page, a unique string that's later replaced from this attached placeholder thing. Um, so the contract of placeholder is an execute of the, all the other parts have been rendered. Um, and um, the problem is pre-render could have things like entities in there. It could have things like um, um, large objects and you would need to do that all that. So we created lazy builder, which is a way stronger contract. And we'll look at that in a moment, just some questions. Yeah, we, Stefan, Stefan will be coming to that use case in a clear moment, but not yet. Um, oh, no, uh, not yet. Uh, a little bit later. Um, the example for that is in part four when we're talking about CDNs. Um, uh, but it's in a sense, uh, cache context is perfect for that. Um, So for expensive to render Drupal forms, would you need to use placeholders? I would always try to use placeholder for it. Um, uh, you can, uh, in a sense, you can cache forms. Um, we'll be coming to forms a little bit later, so I leave that. Um, and you can also use a little bit of render cache logic in the form building logic. So yeah, that's a very good example. So I've had the uh, nice thing of a form uh, which was then stored in form cache. I think it was Drupal 7. Anyway, and it created all this large entity storage that it put into the form. So naturally, Drupal was putting this whole three megabyte of structure into the form always. So what happened? <laughs> um, Memcache got very unhappy, um, compressed, it was just one megabyte. But it was like taking a, a huge, 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 huge um, uh, part um, that um, the placeholder. Uh, so, um, so this and all the three MB was kind of stored within this form cache, but where it shouldn't be. And the solution was essentially to create placeholder, and then um, um, the formers rendered and then in the end um, the um, 
the markup was was added afterwards after the form had been rendered and that way it didn't end up in the form cache so it didn't bloat it up so this way placeholders can be used um, when you're creating a form with like text in between or markup in between or things like that um, but forms and caching are still a little bit ah, it's a form token and everything we're working on it but um, but and we'll go on forms a lot more a little bit later. Yeah, and this question I just leave for now um, because um, we'll be coming to that anyway in the presentation. So lazy builder versus pre-render. Pre-render essentially we um, we um, have our function here, and uh, lazy builder is um, we have. Um, a function call and what's very important is you need to also add it to trusted callbacks um there's this new trusted callbacks interface for that to work and then you put the pizza name here and the important thing is this cannot be an object um this could be a serialized json string if you really want it but it's really not encouraged because it essentially says do only simple things here and one of the reasons was because we want to render comments for example lazily but the problem was if the comment was getting the entity, you could you needed to store the whole entity in the cache. But but the problem is the entity would not have been loaded at that point already. So uh, that makes it a little bit difficult in that. So um, one of the points of, of the lazy builder is essentially that you only put like literal values, like little strings, entity IDs, entity types, and things like that on it. So, and that way you can have have those things. So here we have our pizza lazy builder and um, we can create explicitly a placeholder. So uh, very simple, if you have a lazy builder and you want to always create a placeholder because you, want, you know, you always want to use it as a placeholder, you just call create placeholder equals true. And again, there was a session today, I'm not sure if anyone uh, watched it, but that um, it's called uh, Render Me Lazily or something, uh, which did go uh, way more into detail of that. So I'm referencing to that a little bit for that. Um, um, but I'm reiterating the uh, pitfalls of lazy builders. They must not contain complex data, unfortunately. Thanks to Vim's insistence, this is enforced, and it must not depend on anything in the main page request. This is not enforced, but if you try, it will just fail. So um, in this case, the experience will teach you not to do it. Um, the nice thing about lazy builders and placeholders, and we have some enabled for blocks by default, is you can use BigPad. It's in core, it's in, you enable it, and it's good to go. You can cache the uncacheable because we can very easily split up this is all cacheable, but this small page is not. Easy, create a lazy builder, put it, put it in a placeholder, and it works. And we can finally break up this variation of the pair page per user into pair page plus per user. So, um, yeah, looking at some more questions. I'm going to drink a short moment. Um, oh, there we go. I'm not able to set any dynamic variables during the pre-process hook and every time I need to clear the cache. Um, so you could just, um, there's a secret trick <laughs> for pre-process. So essentially you need your trick template, whatever is outputting that, to output something, whatever you're outputting. And once it's output, um, you can just add it into a render array. So even if you have a string, you could build a render array with markup. Oh. Seems to we have problems.
hello um uh, help us um seems okay it's back okay seems there's some backup stream okay i, I need to break anyway so i'm drinking some water so essentially um so we have a preprocess hook and essentially you know this preprocess hook will eventually output some variable in a twig template so what you can do is you can just change this variable into a render array and then you just add a cache max h0 to it and then your preprocess will never be cached if that's not the case and you want to have it not be as dynamic but a little bit less dynamic. Actually, that's a very nice use case. I'm, I'm totally going to use that um, uh, for um, next session when I build this out a little bit more. Um, you could also create a placeholder, obviously, directly. And then this is output. Um, and then you don't need to deal with the cache. But let's say you add a dynamic class and you really don't want it that cached ever. You just create a render array, you ensure its output, and you put the max h0 on the render array. That's all that's needed. Or you say you are outputting the username here, and you want your preprocess to change when the user's output. Again, you create a render array, you ensure its output, and it's working. So it's always the same. As long as it's rendered somewhere, it will end up in the magic render stack, which is uh, one of the um, uh, cool things. Um, um, so, and even if you um, uh, even if you didn't have um, even if you didn't have like the um, the possibility of and again, I'm just using this here. Let's say we have our preprocess here, whatever, and we have our variables here. And we now now we need to render this by user. So what we can do is we just create a quick render array right here. And we now, um, this should always vary by user. So we just add a cache context here. But we now, for some reason, this preprocess would never output any variable or we don't know what's output. So what we can then do is we can call the um, render service. Uh, our bit, and that way our uh, cache context is um, is added magically to whatever is rendered as part of this render call um, of this part of the tree of the render tree. This will now vary by user. So um, this way you can add things out of band. Um, it's not encouraged, but it works very, 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 very fine. Um, so um, this is a secret trick essentially for for um for doing this so um yeah that hopefully answers the question okay good so part three are we on time where should you catch our job is even more successful, but the customers need to drive to us. That's a little bit bad. So many drive for two hours and more. Can we do something about that? And yes, we can. The solution is we now offer our pizza in supermarkets around the world. The solution is a content delivery network. So Google 8.9 makes it very easy. You choose a CDN, Akamai, Cloudflare, Fastly, or Varnish. You enable a module, and you profit, and it works at least for anonymous pages. Um, so we use our pizza delivery network. Um, the CDN then does the checks. Has the pizza expired? Is the DAF version still matching? And once the DAF version changes, you give the CDN a heads up. And it's so nice that it works really with all major CDNs by now, Cloudflare, Fastly, Akamai. All of them support tag-based um, expiration the same way 
like it drops, works in Drupal internally. Um, and you can also see those headers for yourself. Um, there's a Drupal cache tags debug option that you can just enable. So you just enable it in your uh, services uh, by ML. You just put HTTP response debug cache quality headers to true, and that's it. And that's the result then. You see Xdrupal cache text dev version. So we now, for example, this, this one page um, is um, depending on the dev version. And you can also see the expire state that expires at 9.222, and that's it. So what about the dev itself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Stephanie, you're completely right. Um, this is not for production. This also says not recommend in production environments because if you have a lot of headers, it can totally screw up your browser because um, the response header size is way too large. It can make problems with CDNs. Uh, it can have many side effects. Um, it's still pretty nice to uh, debugging to a full local. So uh, don't do it in production. Don't do it at home, kids. Don't. So what about the dev itself? Um, currently, we need to get it from a warehouse like 10 miles away. So let's put it in a fridge on the counter. Um, and it's important that Drupal has, um, now we come to something else, like we've talked about cache invalidation, cache setting, but by now we have stored everything in the slow database. So we always need to drive to the warehouse and we need to, to, to get it there and um, it's always there. So uh, it takes a while. But if you have things um, um, that is uh, near, the, um, near the counter, um, that you really, for efficiency, when you're making pizza, what you want to do is you want to have your counter, and you would just go to the fridge below it, and you just want to take your dough, and then you want to add your ingredients and you want to bake it and and like that. So this happens now um, where the pizza is prepared, the pizza maker service essentially. So, and the next thing is Drupal has changed fast. And the main rule of thumb is if you have things that are seldom changing, then put it into a special bin and we've seen how we create a bin and you connect that bin to chain fast. And that should be mostly read only cache traffic. So if it expires a lot, don't do it. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> and this can even make problems as cause default configuration because it has uh, config, for example, in there. And some people misuse config and change config on some commerce sites, I've seen that on the fly, so it always expires the config. And if that's an unchained fast, then um, good luck. <laughs> so and it's very simple to do that. You just put into settings uh, the cache bins, please cut off uh, for the cache backend dot chain fast. And that's it. So we create the pizza duff uh, cache bin and uh, do it. Uh, however, we don't want to make a custom-made pizza directly in chain fast. We don't want to have that in APCU, which is essentially in the PHP memory, and it's very limited in that um, it's not like as large as the database, which can go to gigabytes, etc. It's more like a few hundred megabytes. So, if something is changing often or it has a lot of variations, don't put it very near there, unless you've created some way of limiting that. Because um, if you if you write a lot, you can get serious write log problems and the performance will actually decrease, not increase. And if the cache is full, that the big problem is APCU still, um, it can lead to lockups um, because then you need to perform a full garbage collection. Um, so essentially um, to solve that, we would need to provide a cache before the cache. <laughs> and but APCU is still really cool and used in Drupal, for example, for the file cache, which depends only if the file is changed, the class cache, um, because it depends only where it sits on the file system and the config cache only invalidate if the config changes. So, and this is now shows now the importance of having different bins because you can have different cache backends associated with them. And another thing is don't forget about register memcached. 
um, because you can think of MySQL as a warehouse with a really big fridge that's across the street. But Memcached DB is, you can think of a fridge that's in the room next door. And APSU finally is the fridge that's below the counter. So um, large store space, low, two to five millisecond response time. Memcached DB is medium storage space, it's fast, 0 0.5 to one millisecond response time. APCU is small storage space, but it's fast. It's, it can be response times like 0 0.05 milliseconds. It's really freaking fast. And, yeah. um, and I do have a core patch in the making that could make uh, APCU and chain fast, especially so much, much more, more faster. Um, if there's any volunteers, please speak up um, because it's, it's really cool that I just don't find the time to implement it for core. Um, so um, we also have to distinguish for our efficiency 4.0, two parts, essentially creating the pizza in the most efficient way, which is important for our custom-made pizza, which we never cache, as we've said before. But there's also um, the way to create uh, for delivering the pizza to the customer, which is our pizza delivery network. So again, we have like uh, the MySQL, Memcache, GCD, and, and also the browser cache. Don't forget about the browser cache, it's your best friend. Um, and we have caches used for creating the pizza. Um, and um, this is um, also important for that. So before doing that, uh, let's look at questions again. Anyone, any questions while I drink some water? No. So continue. One cast, uh, use case is we want to have a pizza with spring onions, but spring onions you really shouldn't keep. You always should make them fresh rule of thumb. So we can only cache them for a very short time. That's micro caching. It can be a, so um, and so that could be a potential bottleneck. And that's essentially stampede protection. So even if you can cache something only for 10 seconds, do it. Because if you have 1000 users that want to um, look at this um, same thing, and it's cached for 10 seconds, then you have one request to the back end and not 1,000 requests to the backend, even if it's only for 10 seconds. So you have, the difference is, if you have 1,000 users every second, then without a micro cache, you have 1,000 users every second. So your web server will be burning. But if you have a cache of 10 seconds and you have 1,000 users every second, then um, you will have one request every 10 seconds. So two requests, uh, one request every 10 seconds, that's way more manageable. So please, please, please don't forget about micro caching because it's so inefficient to prepare lots of pizzas in parallel. And even if we can cache it only for a very short time, prepare just one spring onion pizza and then just replicate it and then prepare the next one. So that's really important. Here's how uh, stampede protection works in, in general. Um, this is just the, the example X, um, uh, like it works. Um, but there's a pitfall. If your cache is invalidated faster than processed weight, you have a long rebuild time, then you can wait endlessly. So um, if, uh, if the spring onion pizza was for whatever reason invalidated faster than it could be created, um, then you would all those thousand users be be waiting for new data and then it would be all sleeping again, 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 again. And that's a very, very tricky issue. And actually we just um, uh, fixed that in Drupal 7. Um, so the solution is when you're doing micro caching, allow invalid items. As I've said before, we are never truly deleting an item. So when we invalidate the cache, it's still there. It's still sitting in the database. It's still taking up space. It's just not valid anymore. Um, but what we can do is we can add this little known trick, we can add this true here for the cache get. And um, 
and then we can um, check the expiration time yourself. And um, that way you, you're only depending this on the expiration time, which you've set to 10 seconds. But if anything else invalidates it, cash tag invalidation, whatever, you don't care. You say, I'm delivering this for the next 10 seconds so that all the users are getting the same thing. And so we just tricked that in Drupal 7 because some people that were actually misusing the variable system and they think lots of variables set at runtime, please don't do that. If you still have Drupal 7, fine. Had endless waiting for the variable log because essentially 1,000 users came, one rebuilt the cache, but when the next, when the 1,000 users then looked at the cache, it was already outdated. So they had to wait again and wait again and again and again. So. Don't forget caching the own Drupal op cache. Tweak it, ensure it has enough memory. MySQL, query cache, disable it. <laughs> it's inefficient. For query caching, better use a key value anti cache approach. There's also a query cache module by me on GitHub um, if you want to do something very custom but really not needed as Drupal. Everything is abstracted, especially in Drupal 8.9. And browser cache, don't forget about the browser cache. Use it for images and CSS, JavaScript. The service workers, you could even cache the HTML in the browser. Common caching pitfalls. Ajax forms. Posts are still not cached in Drupal core. So if you have an Ajax form submission, they hence will build the whole page. All of those nice things we talked about, dynamic page cache, page cache, caches, they're all not working. Unless you do something yourself, any render cache on post is not working. So this is totally not optimal. Like if you have some Ajax and you have some t-shirts and you want to have a red t-shirt, a blue t-shirt, um, then all that would be needed is query parameter, but instead you have like this huge Ajax post to just re-render the page. Um, the nice things would be to just use a get for this Ajax request. That's possible now. You just apply this core patch, you add data Ajax type get to the attributes, and then the cached get Ajax requests um, um, are coming when changing the product variation. So that works kind of out of the box. It's really just core patch plus this to the element. But forms are still posed, and that's a real problem. And I've written a long issue about it and uh, thought about it a lot. and. Um, we have the advantage forms can already be out of place folder. So uh, max h0 they are. Um, and essentially whenever it's something is has too much variation or it can't be cached and it's in a lazy builder, core will automatically place all that for you. No need for you to create a place for it. So, um, and the form is executed essentially as soon as it's encountered on the page. So if you post to home and there's a newsletter form sitting in a blog, at the bottom of the page, then it needs to rebuild the whole home page before it finally sees the newsletter page and shoots out the newsletter. And the manual way how you could be doing it is you ensure the form is rendered as early as possible in the page rendering process. So, and then I was thinking about, yeah, how would I propose it to you for a solution? I came up with a very simple way. I still have to create the core issue, but you are the first ones to know about it. And unless I miss something crucial, we could have cashable forms by tomorrow. Um, because it's actually very simple to have cashable forms. Um, we had a cache tag for every form, like form pits and newsletter. Um, and if the dynamic page cache render cache does not see a form cache tag on the cache tab, then we allow caching on post because there's nothing that could be different on a post than on a get if there's no form. And that might be need to be opt-in, but that's okay. We, you could just opt-in through that. Um, so the max age is, is, uh, is uh, more than zero. And before I wrote a very long course with some very complicated way, and now by preparing this presentation, I came up with this. I was like, what? <laughs> okay. But now the pizza newsletter block from execution is then just we get the cache get content with placeholders. And because we have the form ID right here, and that is what we get when we are executing a form, that we know where we need to find this form. That's the form ID essentially, or maybe form build ID, but whatever, we can store whatever we want in the cache tags here. Uh, we just check if it's in the main response. No, it's not. So 
we can just return the content as usual and then we just execute the placeholders and we see the newsletter form is actually in a placeholder there and we execute it and that's it. And that way we don't have to build the whole form again uh, to do that. And I might still be missing something for the implementation, but the architecture looks very, very solid to me. Um, uh, tried uh, a lot to think about things where this would break, but couldn't find one. So um, yeah, this could be really, really, really a game changer. <laughs> so yeah, secretly weird. Um, other coming caching pitfalls is um, plan your caching strategy. Now what depends on what? Dependencies are essentially, when does this expire? Always think about that again. Ask yourself the question, what does core need to know to know uh, when to refresh this cache? Now what's not cacheable, create placeholders for it. And then now when something needs to be invalidated, now your variations. And then there's a nice module by Vim, the Rindervis module, and it can be a really, really nice help for you. Um, so yeah, that's it. So more questions. Let me see. Are post method response in REST ABI cached by default? No, they are not. Posts are not cached in core as much as I know. Uh, could block plugin. I'll be looking at the uh, Drupal code core later. I'm going to start to, to look at that later. Um, but I don't now order. Would need to look obviously CDNs more CDN questions. We'll be coming to that in a moment. Um, post method responses cached by default. I don't think they are. As far as I know, Core is not caching any post responses at all, um, to my knowledge. Okay. Next part. Never seen before. Cut that. CDN variations and also engage user caching. Don't have too much time, but it should be okay. Back to pizza. We offer our pizza and supermarkets around the world. We're growing further. We know the market research, the US like the pizza differently than in the UK. So we essentially won, um, uh, we wanna have the um, uh, different homepage. That's exactly the question here. Uh, front page per country, custom IP log app. So yeah, we offer another variation of the pizza for different regions. That's exactly this use case. So variation in CDN. And the real life example is obviously Drupal Commerce. All pages vary by region as the currency of the price is different. And the magic inside of Drupal for that is required cache context. So we just create a pizza region um, cache context like we've seen before. And we make that dependent just on the incoming request header, which is essentially the user's IP. And then we have this pizza region here and whatever is cached within Drupal, it will be cached by this pizza region. So I don't even have to think about it. My cache is just split up on per region. So um, that's really nice. If I know which parts are only region specific, I can also just add it within the render chain where I know this context is needed. But if I want to be really sure, sure, I just add it to that and call it a day. Um, the problem is CDNs do not easily support variation on things that are so easy to make in Drupal as a cache context. Um, so um, the simplest is um, if you vary by URL for language and reason. So if you don't, don't do English, really nice product one, which is different by region, but instead directly put the region in the URL and you just forward to it, your life will be so much simpler. If for marketing reason that's not possible, there are other ways to achieve the same, that if you can do it, do it this way and you'll, you'll be so much happier in that. You just have slash, and you forward to the right region and the right language, we accept language, etc. can even do that in a CDN or whatever like that. And then you will have an easy life. But the complex way is if you want to vary by region inside the CDN is you set a cookie pizza region 
and then you spear to, to the request URL again. Then you convert pizza region cookie to a header in the VCL. Then the you set this custom header X pizza region US, which is what Drupal sees. And then if Drupal knows that this page is varying by this pizza region, then it sends a custom header very X pizza region instead of very cookie. There's another way uh, using Varnish in restarting things. Um, you do one request cache per session to an endpoint, it returns a pizza region, you copy those to a quest object and it's pretty complicated. But again, the important thing is Drupal sees X pizza region you ask, um, you vary by the X pizza region and same again. So Cora could automate that for you. That is why in, in Foresight, I've originally created this cache context system to collapse on either URL or a session in Core. Unfortunately, no one, including me, uh, worked on it. Um, but in theory, with all context, context, you have this cache context hierarchy and all collapse either on being user-specific or session-specific or request-specific, page-specific. In that way, you can essentially um, could have cache context zero then you could have like this cache context equals value. And because it's a, it's a, it's a fixed value, it's XCC zero to XCC whatever, you could have a Varnish configuration which automatically copies this headers over. So it, it, it's possible to automate. Um, and you could even do it automated that if you don't have enough information, Drupal could sell the CDN, hey, this actually would have buried on that and it would be getting those headers, et cetera, like that. Um, um, yeah. The nice thing about that is if we could do this, if we could have like user equals two, would that not all be needed for a syndicate user caching? And yes, that's exactly what's needed. So um, that brings us to authenticate user caching. And dynamic page cache gets you 90% of the way already. And that's great about Drupal, uh, Drupal 8, 9, 10. Uh, we have OS cache essentially in core. Dynamic page cache is an authenticated user cache. So all pages are potentially different by user with the preference. And with the placeholders, we can already split the personalized and static sections. But now the question is, how do we integrate that into the CDN? And um, the authenticated user caching in CDN needs two things. It needs variation in the placeholders and the way to retrieve them. So um, we recap real quick. We have XCC user two, Drupal returns XCC user. We, uh, we set a cookie, CC user, we convert it to a cookie, we set it, etc., cetera, and uh, it's terribly insecure because if I just put a UID in the cookie, then I could impersonate any user. I could be user three, I could be whatever. So there's two ways to solve it, which are very similar. You just use a secret hash per quest context name and value, which you then unfuddle, or you use the signed cookie with the secret hash. And very similar again. So um, um, for example, you could have this cache context user and you have the ID two, and then you have the magic uh, hash here. And if that matches, then um, it's accepted. And if it doesn't match us, it doesn't. And I wouldn't know the hash of user three, so I couldn't impersonate that. The other part, variation we have, the other part is placeholders. There's essentially two ways to do um, placeholders uh, with the CDN. You could have an AJAX request or an ESI edge site include, which essentially is a CDN doing a sub request inside, or you can use JavaScript and cookies. But variation in CDN is always the first thing. So the simple ESI approach is it's not implemented. I have some very old code on, on line set where the cache, cache edu is uh, also an ESI module. Um, you take a hash of the serialized lazy builder, you store the lazy builder in the key value store, and then you just execute the later building from root ESI slash hash. I never had a practical use case for it, unfortunately. But this is the simplest way of doing it. And the placeholder strategy is also very easily added. Um, just look at big pipe, you see how placeholder strategies are defined. 
Um, the problem is with ESI is you don't have all the cache tags in the end response. So um, if you have several layers of caching, that could lead to problems because the headers from the sub response are not included. And the very could be very inefficient um, uh, because all data is stored in the same object in most CDNs. So one way to solve that is to essentially change the path to include what I know this path would be varying on and then um, just put in like a placeholder, like tweak like syntax, and then you need to tweak your CDN configuration to do it. I think we had it once by now, <laughs> sorry. Um, but just wanted to give some ideas. Um, the other part is you could have an Ajax placeholder strategy, probably much simpler. simpler. You execute a lazy builder from Ajax on demand hash, and then you deliver it like the big pipe Ajax again, Big pipe is essentially inline streamed Ajax responses. So nothing would stop you from using the same approach of, um, of creating an Ajax placeholder strategy and calling out to it. But please ensure that those Ajax responses are cached in the CDN. That's so, 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 so crucial uh, because um, if they are not cached in the CDN, um, these Ajax responses that you get there, um, then um, you are not really winning something if you have 12 Ajax requests instead of one page request. And I've seen sites with old auth cache in Drupal 7 that actually got slower with auth cache than faster because um, they were essentially doing way more requests than uh, if they were quitting the page directly. Uh, Sorry, way over my head. Is there really, really, really no simple way? And yes, there is. Let's quickly recap what we need for our saying kid user caching. We need variation and we need placeholder the way to recreate them. And the easiest, easiest way, and several of my commercial clients do that, is they don't vary at all for any pages that are not user specific. They say card and user, we don't cache them in the CDN. But for Slash and my awesome project, it's the same for every user. We just have a little shopping bag and you can click on it to get to your cards. And maybe we have some JavaScript for, um, for storing um, how many items or how much value you have in, in the code and we store it in a cookie for you. But we are give, delivering server side the same page for every user. And that's super secure because you can even automate that. And again, a little bit of a secret reveal here because we could have that in core and probably we should. Um, the way to, to do authenticate user caching with core is essentially you ensure that no user cache context is present or no other cache context be blacklist or only whitelist cache context are present or whatever. And we say that only authenticate user's role is used for this. So only if those two conditions are met, then we're doing this. And then we just remove the very cookie header. We overwrite the cache control header with public max h uh, equals 600. And that's it. And then um, we know that this is no longer varied by cookie. It's public, it's max h 600. And that's our syndicate user caching that will work for every CDN. And um, some of uh, my biggest enterprise clients are using this exact strategy. Essentially, they don't vary at all for the pages. They deliver the same for every user. And it's a simplest way to think about authenticate users caching in that, um, even though this whole placeholdering is nice, but if you need the very, very best performance and the simplest way, it's to, to not do it. And that's also the Amazon, Amazon strategy, by the way. So uh, if you load a page and Amazon takes a little bit longer to, to load, then it will say, hello, username, instead of hello, Fabian. <laughs> I was pretty curious to see that, but yeah, that's how they do it. Um, so, um, and you can just use JavaScript for simple things like the username, unless you need to ensure that it's also usable without JavaScript. You can also use your own very simple placeholder strategy. You just put in diff, ID, pizza model, username, add some JavaScript, Drupal behaviors like usual, jQuery, whatever, put it in a cookie and that works. And um, essentially, 
Um, for our enterprise clients, we use a little module called Cash Flow Cookie Handling. Ports are very welcome. It's a very simple module and um, would probably mostly be even working out of the box in Drupal 8 because it doesn't really have any uh, bad parts except for some uh, Ajax things that allow uh, gives you some JavaScript function. This essentially allows your user logs in. There's one Ajax request done for all the personalized data um, that is still blocking the page request. And afterwards, it just gets that from the cookie. And it ever changes server side. The server sends a special, uh, sends new uh, cookies. And that's it. So that solves it. Yeah. And um, this is kind of like um, the simplest way to do authenticated users you think of variation in placeholders. And obviously, because we have placeholders already, you don't need to do your own. You could just use a JavaScript placeholding strategy, which would output those cookies, uh, or it would just put out output placeholders for the things you know, and you can, can do it yourself. But uh, in essence, um, uh, the important part is um, you don't need to, um, you don't need to, um, to overcomplicate it. You can do it, and Core has all the capabilities to do the very nice things with this, um, but you can also just keep it simple. So have fun, and I'll make pizza now because I'm, I'm also gotten really, really hungry. So that's the end. So if you have any more questions, uh, while we take more questions, you can follow me at Fabian Fans on Twitter. Uh, yeah, so this is answered. Um, yes, you can build a context for that. We've just shown how. Um, yep, we can differ, have a different front page. CDNs need, definitely need to know about cache context too. And the easiest is if you find some way to vary it by URL because CDNs already vary by URL. So that's working. So then we have this here. Uh, Questions, more questions, anyone? All questions you ever want to ask me. Wonderful content, Fabian. Um, what call to action would you offer to the crowd? Oh, um, I don't know the experience level, but um, if anyone wants to help out with either the chain fast patch that's been sitting there for over a year by now, or um, uh, um, or um, with any any of the other things, or want to want to create at least a core issue with uh, the secret reveal here, uh, please be very welcome. I'm unfortunately very busy, but fortunately I still can carve up time for for Drupal to come. Uh, what pizza am I going to get? Uh, I don't know. Margarita, probably. Maybe make it vegan. Let's see. Uh, APCU doesn't persist with command line requests, so chain fast strategy is not desirable for quantas such as, as right. Um, yes, that's unfortunately right. So um, in theory, Nothing would stop APCU from uh, using the same thing as while it's running in PHP FPM. So it could use a named space as well. Um, no one has implemented that, however. It's a little bit unfortunate, but yeah, reality right now. Uh, however, um, what you could do is, um, and I've tested the performance, um, it's a very Linux specific thing, but you can just use create a, create a very little module which is like APCU file cache and APCU uh, cache, which is SHM file cache and SHM cache. And you just write files to DevHSM. It works amazingly well and is pretty fast. So if you want to have, uh, and probably we should consider that even for core, because as you said, APCU is pretty much useless for a command line. And if you say shared memory is available, then we could, could essentially, um, do something opt in for that, or at least make it very simple to do with the contract module. So that's a great idea. Um, I don't think variation cache does need to get into core. I think we just 
someone needs to spend the time to um, detangle the render cache and essentially um, make it the own service that can easily be used with get and set and not just with, with render arrays. So um, it really, um, it's just a refactoring of render cache service. A variation cache is great, but unfortunately it has to override all the services. So whenever core changes, variation cache has to change as well. So I don't think that's scalable. Two minutes, 42 seconds, last chance. Ah, okay. So if you use a cache context, um, yes, it will um, affect the dynamic page cache um, and will add the cache context to the dynamic page cache for your block plugin. Um, but um, um, if you, the, the, the thing is, how much does it vary? If it's the face of the moon, it's three variations, like Kreitzman, full, um, no moon. Um, but um, if it's like ch adding a cache context per user, then core will automatically place all those blocks. So there's nothing you need to do. Inspect the content of memcached um, for production. Um, I usually um, change the uh, code of um, I usually just add monitoring directly where cache get cache sets happening. So um, I hack the service. Very pragmatic. Uh, so, um, or um, I ensure I write it to somewhere else like dev HHM or whatever. Another good way is if you're using memcached, the ASCII protocol is to just use S trace or any other network monitoring tool because it's all plain text. So it's very nice to see requests coming in in real time in that. 